April of 1994, Bruce Babbitt and Michael Espy, who were interior and agricultural secretaries, approved a law that wolves would be reintroduced in the Yellowstone National Park in central Idaho via transportation from Canada after their area-based extinction in the 1920s. The gray wolf reintroduction in Yellowstone breaks boundaries not only in the fact that it is one of the most controversial federalistic problems that is still in debate today, but also because it is one of our only reintroductions that accepts trophic cascades, the theory that predators are as important as their prey in their ecosystems in the United States. This is Environmental Boundary Breaking, the Grey Wolf Reintroduction to Yellowstone. Our story begins in the 1920s. At this point in time, very little is understood of the balance a predatory animal brings to an environment. Here's Douglas Smith, the leader of the Yellowstone Wolf Reintroduction, explaining how people reacted at first to the wolves of Yellowstone. And so we tried to eradicate them. Wolves, cougars, coyotes, bobcat, lynx. We did that in the early part of the 20th century because we thought that was the ideal. We didn't have a complex mindset about policy in terms of natural. Right away, scientists noticed that the amount of elk skyrocketed without their primary predator to keep their numbers in check. The coyotes' numbers also jumped as well. Without their main competition, they were very successful. Sadly, a few animals' sudden success led to a dozen others' downfalls. One example of this is the beaver. The beaver uses willow branches profusely for both food and for their dams and lodges. This is also the perfect food for the elk, who now consume much, much more of it with their heightened numbers. The beavers were not the only ones to suffer. The fox, black bear, brown bear, raven, wild rodent, and songbird population was lowered just to name a few. The songbirds could not eat the berries from the bushes if the much larger and more dangerous elk ate to them first. And the wild rodents, barely considered a snack to most wolves, would be a main target to a coyote, which is now unrivaled and high in numbers. Even the mighty brown bear was facing problems, with less wolves comes less leftover kills that a large animal such as a bear may rely on if they could not make a kill themselves. This idea that wolves did nothing to help an environment stayed mostly in the minds of many, and as of the year 1960, the wolf has been restricted only to the western UP of Michigan and northeastern Minnesota, as seen on this map. Finally, in the year 1966, the first ever list of species that were in need of help appeared. This was including the gray wolf. This was called the Endangered Species Preservation Act of 1966, which would eventually turn into the Endangered Species Act of 1973. This act would feature not only animals from the USA, but also animals on international levels. But it still fell under the rights of federalism, which means the states were forced to comply to all environmental projects brought up from this act. At this point, many still believe the wolf and other predatory animals on this list were dangerous and plain evil, so the states did not take too well to this, but eventually, they were required to comply. This act helped the gray wolf and its rapidly decreasing numbers as it prohibited unregulated hunting on the animals. Sadly, their numbers were not yet restored to the previous amounts, and Yellowstone still suffered from the absence of the wolf. Nothing seems to be done about it until 1991. An EIS, also known as an Environmental Impact Statement, is used to convince the government to support their idea of how necessary it is to do something including the natural environment. This EIS is incredibly important to our topic in specific as it is describing how we should reintroduce wolves in the Yellowstone and its nearby areas. The EIS was accepted to be reviewed in May of 1994. That is when Bruce Babbitt and Michael Espy approved the law so that wolves would be pulled from a Yellowstone Lake area in Canada and be moved to the National Park itself in January of 1995 and 1996. Idaho and its people, who were also being affected by this law, despised this change as it meant the wolf returns to their area, but under the Endangered Species Act it was completely illegal, as explained by Laird Dell, an Idaho state legislator. There is no choice. You must work with the law, you must work within the law, and whenever there is a clash, a direct clash, state and local interests will lose. It's that fundamental. 
So this finally brings us to the reintroduction itself. The time is January of 1995. The place is Jasper National Park from Alberta. It was chosen for its similarity in Yellowstone National Park itself, which would be very useful as 14 wolves from this area would be moved to Yellowstone. The wolves were moved to acclimation pens so that they could get used to their new habitat before being let loose inside of it. The very, very few other wolf reintroductions before this one have proven that wolves that were held in captivity for longer strayed less from the area and instead accepted their new surroundings. The pens from 1995 and mostly from 1996 appeared in the northern parts of the park, an area with around 15,000 elk. The 1995 and 1996 wolves were released between March 21st and the 27th, and April 2nd and the 14th. For both years, they were held in pens for three months. Observation numbers went better than scientists expected, with only 256 sheep and 91 cattle being killed by the wolves from 1995 to 2003. As well as this, 9 wolves were born in 1995 and 14 were born in 1996. The death numbers were less than expected, but still saddening, with a total of 11 wolf deaths in both years. 4 out of 11 of these deaths were human related. The most interesting observation though, was the amount of elk that the wolves hunted, which brings us what happened after the wolves came back to Yellowstone. Almost immediately, from when the wolves were let loose into the park, the elk and deer numbers plummeted. Right away, that may not sound like a positive, but it definitely is. Remember, the elk and deer have had numbers way, way higher than they should have been for more than 70 years. This was very good because due to the wolves killing, life came back to Yellowstone. Take the fox for example. Its numbers were falling rapidly because of the coyotes unrivaled hold on the park. Then the wolf came back. They killed some coyotes and so the fox could grow back to its previous numbers. Also due to the sudden absence of deer, the bushes were now much less crowded, allowing songbirds and black bears to eat more berries as well as allowing beavers to get their precious willow trees back. As well as this, tree sizes within forests were said to quintupled and many other plants grew back to a pre-1920 size. Sadly, not everyone agrees with the Great Wolf Reintroduction. The fact that it is a federal issue means the states had lost their rights of natural resources including the Great Wolf making them unable to do anything about the wolf until they are delisted. To be delisted, the wolves must be in substantial numbers and there must be a management plan for the species. The reason they want the wolves unfederally protected is because some believe the wolves are decimating their deer herds and slaughtering their livestock. Some even fear for their own safety, such as Leonor Barrett, an Idaho state legislator. In Alaska, when they send their children to school, they walk them to the bus and they go armed do I have to live like that in Idaho? Shouldn't have to, but just so somebody from out of state or back east or somebody that sits in an office all week and thinks wolves are cute and cuddly and how pretty. No, this is Idaho. They don't have any right to visit those kinds of things onto my state. Despite Bray's concerns, there has been no documented kills upon humans from wolves in the continental United States since at least the year 1900. Although it was one of the most controversial environmental projects in history, because of its amazing boundary breaking, the Grail for introduction to Yellowstone influences many other trophic cascade reintroductions, including the Swift Fox reintroduction 1998, the Fisher reintroduction of 2008, and finally, the Great Wolf reintroduction to Isle Royale in 2018. Not only this, but the reintroduction also made an impact in federalism that is still being debated to today, with people disagreeing on if the national government has too much power or if it is the states that need less power. Although, no matter what side you are on, the biodiverse effect that the wolves had on Yellowstone is monumental and amazes us to this day.